And what I heard in my simple pool guy mind was, you know, Marcus, if you just obsess over your customers' questions, worries, fears, issues, concerns, and you're willing to address them on your website, through text, through video, you just might save your business. Welcome to the Owner's Pride Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Williams. And today... On the Owner's Pride Podcast, I'm not even going to be messing around. We're going to get right into it because I have, out of all of my favorite authors that I read business books from, this guy is right up in the top. It's kind of like the my my holy trinity of, of incredible authors. Today I have Mr. Marcus Sheridan from you, They Ask, You Answer. Marcus, how are you doing today? Dan, it's great to be here. I got a feeling we're going to have a great conversation, brother. You know, we, we really are. We really are. So I, I was kind of prompted, your book is one of my absolute favorite books. And, and so right before we crack right into that, I just want to, I want to go back to your beginnings um, to really make it so, show how tightly you can kind of relate to all of the guys who are listening to this podcast, who are solopreneurs and small businesses. You originally, before your book and before your company and everything, you were a solopreneur yourself, correct? Yeah, well, I mean, I started a swimming pool company with two buddies uh, in 2001. And so it was it was very basic, very small, working out of literally a beat-up pickup truck. And um, they were working out in the field installing pools and we had just essentially opened up a small retail store and they said to me, hey, Marcus, can you run the retail store until uh, or while we are installing uh, pools out in the field? And I said, yeah, sure. And uh, I said, you know, I don't think I'll be here long because I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do with my life because I was probably only like 22, 23 at the time. And they said, no problem. And six months into it, they said, would you be a partner? And I became a partner. And as they say, the rest is, is history. Yeah. Now, with that becoming a partner, and this is just kind of a little side note, did you guys go through all the legal hurdles to actually make yourself a partner? And did you use a lawyer when you signed all these papers and stuff? <laughs> um, you know, I think eventually we did. Uh, you don't want to talk about the, 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 the PETA, that is the legalese of uh, ownerships and uh, LLCs and corporations and S-Corps versus C-Corps. Oh, my goodness. You want to talk about frustrating. I know anybody's listening to this. That's probably one of the biggest frustrations getting into business is you have to become uh, you know, knowledgeable about uh, accounting laws, business laws. <laughs> it's just very frustrating. Yeah, I, I get. I, so I have guys. We do a lot of coaching with a lot of the guys in our networks, and they'll call me and they're like, "Hey, I'm going to take on this guy as a partner," and but there's really no structure to it, and it's it seems yeah. terrifying. You gotta it, have an ownership agreement. Now, of course, I've gone through that multiple times because I've got you know multiple businesses today, and you know it's the it's at first you want to just push back on it, especially if you have you should have an attorney when you do that. Attorney needs to write it up. And there's all the God forbid statements, right? God forbid such and such happens. Somebody dies. Somebody decides to, you know, uh, leave. Somebody decides to do this. This and this happens. Like all those statements, they call them God forbid statements. You got to get them out in the air. And what's interesting is that's oftentimes the, that can be the first test of a partnership. Because I have worked with people before that once you got, that I thought, you know, we, we had something going, so we looked at doing some type of joint venture. And once we got to the owner's agreement, the legal document, that's when I could see that they weren't mature enough to be a good partner for me long term. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you're trying to set yourself up for the long term, you really have to t look at all of those things and take that into consideration. Uh, I know a lot of the fellas are kind of like, hey, I got this guy who wants to be my partner. So now he's going to have half of my company. I'm like, well, what exactly responsibilities is he taking over? What are your expectations? And man, if you don't lay that stuff out right. I mean, yeah, you don't have problems. Yep, no doubt about it, man. You, yep. you cannot be more careful. Uh, than that, it's a quick way to really add a lot of stress, frustration, pain, and sadness to your to your life. You can't take it lightly. 
So thinking back to when it was just you were, and this is really, again, similar to what the world of the detailer is. When you guys were doing your sales to get more people to be customers for the pool cleaning side of the business, and this is before the, you know, the, the, the selling the fiberglass pools. What were you doing back then in those old days as far as your marketing to to reach those customers? Well, I mean, we just did – I mean, it was a lot of shotgun marketing back in the day. I mean, these were the uh, – in the early 2000s, there were still – most businesses had the impression that they didn't have to be online, or at least a lot of them didn't think they had to be online. And uh, so it was the classic case of Yellow Pages at the time, which – you know, I think if anybody here can remember the yellow pages, my <laughs> goodness, I mean, they were they were designed by the devil himself. And then you had, uh, you know, your traditional uh, radio advertising. I, I can remember doing a little bit of that, and you know, we did uh, some like uh, signs in yards. I mean, we just did a little bit of every. I mean, we just did all the things. We had no rhyme, no reason. We had no clear strategy. That's where we were. Okay, and just pop us up real quick for the background of like how the, the market crashed and then you, you made your switch. Yeah. So, you know, we, we grew the business and it was clear that the core for us from 2001, 2008, figuring out who we were more and more realized we wanted to be, you know, focus on in ground swimming pool installation, specifically fiberglass pools. But in 2000, end of 2008, 2009, the market collapses, and I think we're going to lose the business, and I think we're going to file bankruptcy. But, you know, the good thing about pain and suffering, Dan, is it forces us to do things that otherwise we might not have done, right? We have nothing to lose. And so it was during this time that I started to read about the internet and see all these phrases online like inbound marketing, content marketing, social media, stuff like that. And what I heard in my simple pool guy mind was, you know, Marcus, if you just obsess of your customers' questions, worries, fears, issues, concerns, and you're willing to address them on your website, through text, through video, you just might save your business. And so I can recall just sitting down one night and brainstorming all the questions I had received over the years that somebody would have about buying an in-ground pool or a fiberglass swimming pool. And then over the next couple of years, late at night, I'd sit there at my kitchen table I write an article or I make a video that was answering these questions. And to make a long story short, we became the most traffic swimming pool website in the world. And then we became a manufacturer of fiberglass pools. Then we became a franchise where we had uh, river pools of all over the country. And I sold the uh, manufacturing and franchising side in uh, 2021. But, you know, it was, and I still own the original to this day, I own the original pool installation company, River Pools of Virginia. But it's been an amazing ride and it all happened because of this willingness to openly, transparently, honestly address the questions that most people in our industry wouldn't address. Yeah. You know, I, so as I was reading your book last year, I was out also searching for a new set of golf clubs. And it was like an aha moment as I was and you would think that after being in this industry that I'm in for 20 years, that it would have been clear, but it, it really never, ever was. So I was searching for golf clubs and I would put in senior flex, Callaway, easiest to hit golf clubs. And I would hit it. And all of these blog posts would come up that were literally exactly how you were describing how to do sales. Were people doing that style before? And it just kind of, or, or, did you really revolutionize and sort of were the catalyst for that style? Well, you know, one thing that I love about blue collar spaces and certainly detailing is it falls in that category is most of the business owners are not going to think innovatively. They're not going to take advantage of digital and they're not going to do many of the things that can be done today to build your brand and to you know attract customers, attract buyers your way. And so at this time, very, very few swimming pool companies in the world were producing any content online. None of them, though, were addressing some of those questions 
we were addressing. I mean, we were the first to talk about cost and price in the entire world on our website. We were the first to address competitors and talk about competitors openly and honestly. Uh, no negatives, but we were openly talking about competition. We addressed everything. If somebody was thinking it, we were addressing it. And so we were, we were a solid decade in front of anybody in the swing pool space. So uh, speaking of those negatives, so if you are talking about somebody else's company, and, and I always tell the guys that I work with, you know, stand on what you have to offer that's special and that's different without disparaging anybody else. But what if what if there are like some things like, you know, one of the things, and I'm like kind of tiptoe around how to even say this, but our company at Owner's Pride, we have a compliant warranty program, meaning it follows all the rules of the Federal Trade Commission and the Magnus and Moss Act of 1975. And But the other companies in the space don't really have what we have. So how do you like n- positively approach to like highlight what your advantages, no matter what those advantages are as a company, without disparaging another company? Well, so disparaging to me is when you say a company's name and you blatantly speak negatively about them, okay? If I'm going to say somebody else's name, I'm going to speak something that they themselves probably say about themselves, right? Um, Now, when it comes to how to do this, a lot of different ways. You know, for example, in the book we talk about there's basically five subjects that when people are researching companies, they tend to research the most. They want to research cost questions. They want to research problems or negatives. They want to research comparisons. They want to uh, research reviews. And they want to research best type questions. Think about how many times you've you search the word best or most or top online. So you've got cost, problems, comparisons, reviews, and best. So when you're looking to buy something, a product or a service, you want to know roughly how much is it, what could go wrong, the problems, what are the negatives, how does it compare to the other thing that I'm looking at, what's everybody saying about it, and what is the best it. Those are the big five. And so there's different ways that you can integrate some of that information you just said. So for example, let's say you're, you're doing cost and you're like, how much does a such and such cost or you know, a full guide to understanding you know, detailing cost for and you could choose a particular you know, type of detailing. And then within that, you can say, now listen, if you're trying to understand how much detail it costs in this particular field, right, then you got to understand that there's different tiers of businesses in this space. Now, there's a lot of businesses that are uh, on, we would, let's just say there's three tiers. There's a low, medium, and high end tier. And with each one of those, we're going to give you some general descriptions of each. So on the low end, they might be very, very price driven. Oftentimes, they don't have any type of insurance. Uh, uh, they don't have, you know, for example, you know, you're talking about um, uh, uh, they don't have workman's cop. That could mm-hmm. be an example. And so all the things that they haven't even thought about before, right? And so when you talk about these things, you can talk about the pros and the cons to each the fact that they do and don't have these things. And then you can talk about the next tier and you talk about the next tier. And so that they understand by the end of it is like, okay, so there's certain, you know, companies that have, you know, they have these types of, um, in, in this case, insurances or whatever the thing might be. And so that's why they cost more because not only do they have these safeguards built in place and they've got these systems that others don't have and they've got these technologies that others don't have. But because they do all these things, they cost 25, 50% more, 100% more than the ones that are working, you know, out of the back of their car and they have no insurance, they have no workers' comp, they have no nothing. So explaining that helps them see, okay, here's where I want to be. And that's not your job to say, though, you don't want to work with the low end. It's your job to present an honest depiction of those different ends classifications tiers and then allow them as the homeowner to decide as as i was listening to your book for my third time over the weekend in preparation for this 
times we started talking about having the price as one of the main things to put out on the website and in the detail industry i'm telling you this is like the one of the biggest like battles like everybody's like uh, sure. i can't put my price on there so i'm listening to it and i'm thinking oh, and then you're like you're probably thinking that your industry is different <laughs> and i was like thinking exactly what they were going to say so so right um if you and, and the reason that the guys don't put their price is because there's so many variables that would take place of what condition a paint is in before you would you know polish it how much work you'd have to do before you put a ceramic coating or somebody's boat how much how chalky it was and how much you had to fix it first um and you, your solution to that was basically to do education to educate the customer on where those may be or like why something would have for that instance is it better to put a price range or a starting at price yeah i think a range is really really smart you know in fact you know let's just um let's just do the marine detailing for a second right and this is one that's close to my heart because you know I've, i own a sport fishing boat and um i've had i've had it detailed before and so if I'm a detailer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, be pretty general at first and say, listen, if you have a sport fishing boat and you're wondering how much it is, first let's explain all the different factors that are going to drive cost in the industry. Okay. So you might say things like, uh, does it have a tower or not? You know, what is the length? What is the width? You know, um, you know, how, how old is, you know, you know, how, how, how much has it been in the water? It's like all these different things, like all these different factors. You explain that. Then you can go on um, to explain things like, now, what you're going to find in the industry is some work by the job, some work by the hour. So you can explain that. You're going to talk about some of the things that we already discussed, what separates uh, what is, you know, high end from a low end. Uh, you can talk about some of the different chemicals, uh, cleaners that are used. And... Um, how some are using essentially better technology uh, than others. There's cleaning equipment that are more effective, but once again, that generally is going to escalate uh, pricing. And so then finally what you might do is you might say, now, to give you a sense for things, um, you could expect uh, in the marine space for a sport fishing boat, if it's um, you know in the 30 to 40 foot class, you're typically going to see this type of range. If you're in the 40 to 50 foot class, you're going to see this type of range. In the 50 to 60, this type of range, all depending on a variety of you know, factors. And you can, again, list out those factors. Now, the range can be as big as you want it to be. You know, you could literally say, you're, you're, you know, the average for detail for a 40 to 50 foot sport fishing boat is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, $300 to $3,000. Mm -hmm. Right, but you're gonna you're gonna say things like cleaning the engine room. It's a big factor, right? It's like it's just like you're gonna go down the list, and now all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, now I understand. Now I'm getting a sense for things. But you don't have to put your exact price. Now I would recommend that you that you do say generally here's where most of our jobs fall at such and such company. So most of the sport fishing boats that we do at you know Sheridan's. Uh, detailing fall in the 1500 to $3,000 range as an example. Okay. And I, I think the best thing about that is um, how it really does kind of move the, the tire kickers to the side. You know, you, you know, if you're not even qualified for it, you're probably not going to pursue anything else. And in our industry, you know, especially because a lot of the guys do social media advertising and they're just putting out a, a fancy picture without really trying to address the pro or answer the questions, you know, they're more focused on like, look how shiny this car is. I'm the best polisher west of the Mississippi than focusing when, and on the customer. that's why when you do those social videos, which like there's no, like there's few industries that are, are, are made for social media like the detailing space because of the power of before after videos mm -hmm. and uh, what are essentially journey videos, like showing the time lapse of where it was and where it ended up. Those are unfreaking believable. If you don't do that for every job that you have from now until the end of time, you're basically saying, I don't like to sell stuff because that is your story. 
and and you should be you should be showing a lot of those at the same time you should be showing videos on okay so let's talk about some of the different tech cleaning techniques that you see in the marketplace here's what a lot of companies do we don't do that here's the reasons why we don't do that here's let's talk about today some of the uh, cleaners that we use here's why we use them and here's what you'll see oftentimes the competition using now the reason why we don't use that is because of this and this and this and so if you're meeting with the detailer and trying to figure out who you're going to work with long term find out what type of cleaner they use because now you know the difference between these two like these are the things that somebody says oh, i didn't know that i didn't know that i didn't know that so don't complain all day long that you're losing jobs because you're more expensive. In fact, you should be literally bragging that you're more expensive because of the fact that you do all these things that no one else does, which is a much greater safeguard for the owner of the thing. Yeah. And I tell the guys too, you know, there's a reason that there's a um, Sizzler and a Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. There's customers for a drive through tunnel car wash and a high end detail shop. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's a place in the market for all of them. Just don't, don't get off offended when the tunnel car wash guy doesn't want their car polished and ceramic coated. Yeah. It's one of those things too, where it's like, I always say the happiest day in the life of the business of a business isn't when you think you know who you are it's when you know absolutely what you're not yeah. because the moment you know what you're not is when you're able to draw a line in the sand and say hey listen if you're looking for such and such that's not something we offer and therefore we're probably not the best fit for you but if you're looking for such and such well then we might be a great option right now that is night and day that's night and day and if you like if you're willing to do that again the moment you're willing to say what you're not is the moment you become dramatically more attractive than to those who you are a good fit for if you're willing to say now listen our only spe like we only specialize in high end sport fishing boats that's what we do we feel like we're the best in the world because that's what we focus on we've got some systems that we've created for those and our customers love those systems. We understand those boats very, very well. This is also why, though, we don't do other types of, let's say, luxury yachts. We focus on sport fishing boats. Now, you do that, all of a sudden, like, every sport fishing boat person is like, that, that's my guy. That's my dude. Because he gets me. He knows what to look for with my boat. He's been there before. It's nothing's going to surprise him. He knows how to not screw up my engine room or how to not screw up my, uh, you know, some of my controls or my tower or whatever that thing is because he's worked on it before. So kind of like find that Venn diagram of the hedgehog concept and stay, stick, find out where your little centerpiece is in there and stick in that lane. Good to great. Really one of the best business books of all time. I mean, that's my number one. You know, it's it's one of my favorite too. But you're right up there in that in that mix of my favorites and my favorites. Okay, let's stick on that big five for a minute, and we'll go to the problems part. Now, the problems that's not necessarily um, it, fear. It's not the problems they have, yeah, it's not necessarily their fears. Although you want to address those too, it's the negative questions, the worry questions that people have about that product or service that you sell. So, in other words, they might say. A question to you like is it true that somebody told me that your competitor said that and it's whatever whatever that is right so for <clears throat> in the case of fiberglass pools it could have been are fiberglass pools ugly are fiberglass pools cheap do fiberglass pools pop out of the ground what are the problems of the fiberglass pool now all these are questions that somebody asks if they're actually interested in buying a fiberglass pool but most fiberglass pool companies don't want to talk about them because they think oh that's a perceived negative no 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 no. those are the questions that are most important they're incredibly valuable because they denote a serious buyer that's when someone is researching what could go wrong with the thing and so you want to do the same thing in your space find out what those negatives are is it true that somebody told me that address those and now you get in front of the issue and the greatest way in life to resolve a concern is to address it before it becomes a concern. Yeah. I was working on it on a building up a checklist um, for people. So I kind of did a poll to ask what like the most common things that get missed that would maybe be a value to have on a checklist at the end of a detail that you could give to your customer. Um, mm -hmm. 
and and similar similar to these problems this is just another list of things but a hundred percent if you're not addressing exactly what they need <laughs> then you're just completely missing the That's right okay so versus and comparisons now this is where uh, where again where you don't want to you know talk down about so, about somebody but really just kind of raise up what you have yeah i mean it could be comparing um you know cleaners versus cleaners techniques versus techniques styles versus styles um companies versus companies brands versus brands but again you you got to say the pros and the cons of each one so you can't just talk about hey we use this cleaner and and here's the reason why because it's so awesome you have to be willing to say but it's potentially this might not be the best fit for you in your situation because it is 30 percent more expensive than what you find everybody else using in the market so we said early on, okay, we're going to have to charge more if we use this cleaner. We decided, hey, we're going to use this knowing that people are willing to pay that. Not everybody, but some people really want that type of protection for, in this case, their boat or whatever that thing is. So the, so the next one on this list is reviews. Reviews are incredibly hard to get. I think it's just human nature that, you know, if you do something bad or somebody's pissed at you, they're very quick to leave a review. And and I find this, you know, both with um with the detailing businesses, our businesses, the podcast, the whole thing, getting people to actually take the time to leave those reviews. But if we think about it, you you know, as you put in the book, everything that you buy, you probably go and look at reviews and they're so, so important. So how do you help get people spark to leave these reviews for you? Well, I mean, the key is you ask them after you did a good job and you do it real time and you make it easy and you say, if I send you a link, would you be willing to leave a review? You got to make it so that it's truly, truly seamless. But when we talk about reviews in the book, it goes beyond that too. It's like you should be producing reviews for the different, let's say, products that you offer. And so, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, let's say, let's just talk about, I, I'm going to stick with what I know, which is marine, okay, and boats. And so if somebody was looking at different cleaners for boats, which I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at different cleaners and stuff like that, different type of tools to clean. Well, that's one of those things where you could easily, as the detailer, do a review on all the different, like really some of the top cleaners in the marine space. Because if that's my world, nobody can speak to it like you can. And now you're teaching the masses. Now you might say, well, Marcus, a lot of those people are doing their own thing. Yeah. And a lot of them are going to watch you and like, man, I, I don't want to do this. I want him to do it. He can do it way, way better than me. Or when they get to a point like, me, like at some one point in my life, I was cleaning most of my own stuff. I got to a financial place where I wanted to outsource it, right? And so that's when, you know, I, if I can develop a relationship with you early on and you're the one that's, it's no different than like outside the big five, if there was a number six, Dan, it would be how to, which is prolific in the cleaning detailing space because you know, if someone, you know, says, you know, uh, in this ex example of how to plus a best, you know, uh, what is the best way to clean a tower on a sport fishing boat? All right. That's a really great potential video. It's a great potential article right there. And when you watch this, somebody sees what goes into doing it right. They might say, you know what? I don't, I don't want to fool with that. And that's why how to's are so very powerful. Like as a pool guy, I did lots of videos on like how to close or winterize your swimming pool for the season. And when I started doing them, people in the industry had never done them before. And they're like, dude, you're teaching people how to winterize a pool. It's going to hurt your service business. I'm like, no ding dong. Because as soon as they realize what goes into servicing it the right way, winterizing it the right way, they're going to say, I don't want any parts of this. <laughs> so, you know, uh, in fact, you know, most people listening to this have probably heard of the Geek Squad before. They're that company that fixes your computers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they do a lot of this they ask you answer type of content on their website. And somebody once asked their CEO, Yeah, aren't you afraid to answer all these, you know, technical questions? You're just showing people how to fix their problems. He said, Don't you realize my number one customer is the one that tries to do it themselves? 
right? And so that is absolutely the case that we've seen in many, many industries. Detailing is certainly one of those. And so you want to show how to do the thing. That makes many, many people realize, A, now I know how. I trust this person even though I'm not hiring them. Or B, when I am ready to hire somebody, that's going to be the first person I call. Yeah. It's so hard for me not to just jump all over the place because I have so many, so many things I want to throw in here. So let's finish with this last of the big five for the best in class, which again, it, this whole thing that you're talking about right here, again, when I was looking for golf clubs, it was like an aha moment. Like literally everything that you were saying was what I went through while I was looking for them. So, um, and I would, of course, say the easiest to hit or the best in class or, or, you know, for the golf clubs. But let's talk about that for a minute, and then I'm going to go all over the place. So for detailers, this is, this is one that you have to do. You want to do it right away because people are searching all the time, stuff like if, if it was me, I live, uh, let's say, I, my uh, sport fishing boat is in the Outer Banks. It's in Manio, North Carolina. And so I would go online and I'd search best um, – Boat Detailers, Manio, North Carolina. That's probably how I would search it. That's probably how you would search it too. Or Best Boat Detailers, Nags Head, North Carolina. So you want to create an article that is, you know, a review of the five best uh, uh, sport fishing boat detailers in Manio, North Carolina. And now the power behind that is. If you want to mention yourself, you can, but you got to be open about the fact that you might not be the best fit for everyone. You got to come across unbiased. This is key. You got to be willing to mention your competitors here. What's powerful about mentioning your competitors is that now all of a sudden, when people research, let's say somebody mentions a competitor name plus Manio, North Carolina plus the word reviews, there's a very good chance that they could stumble across that article, that video that you had written, that you had produced. Now they're going to learn from you and be introduced to you and your brand. This is crazy powerful. And so best of plus geographic locations, crazy. So for every type of detailing you do, you should have you know best um, sports car detailer, your town, your area. And if you do other types of detailing, you should create separate articles for each one. Powerful. And it's really just hard to wrap your head. So how do you, both as a chemical company and as a detailer, not say I'm the best of the best for everything and be unbiased? Like how do, how do you actually approach simple that? Way to, yeah, a simple way to do this. If you go online and you, you uh, Google um, best pool builders, Richmond, Virginia, you can, you can quickly see an article that I wrote on this and you'll see how it's done. Now, I came up with a list of the top five pool builders in Richmond, Virginia, and I didn't even put myself on that list of five because I'm like, I don't even want to come across as biased. But what's so powerful is if I, you know, if I say something like this, if I open up the article and I say, you know, one of the questions we get here all the time is, you know, Marcus, who are some of the other great pool builders in the Richmond area? Well, because we believe so much in education and being so honest with our customers, we decided to come up with a list of five of the best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia. And we certainly hope this helps you decide who is the company for you. Now, the fact that I said that already, this company's like, a pool builder is willing to answer this? I love these guys. And so they're very likely now going to trust us more. They're going to feel like we're an expert. They're much more likely to reach out. Okay. Okay. So we, we ran through those big five. Now, if we compare, is everything that from your book still relevant, you know, seven yes. years later? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the most recent version came out, a revised version came out in 2019. It's more relevant than ever. I can promise you it's more relevant than ever because what's happening is customers are buyers are more impatient than they've ever been. They want answers more than they've ever wanted it. And folks, I mean, still in the detailing space, I can tell you not many are dominating this space like could be that have done they ask you answer. You could be the one. And so lean into this. Become that voice of trust. Talk about the things that others, just you talking about cost and price of your services, it puts you in a unique class of your own. I mean, that is so stinking powerful. It's a game changer if you're willing to do that. And I hope, uh, listen, 
ultimately, this is a tool that generates trust. It's a framework for trust. Trust is always going to be a fundamental part of your business. As a detailer, there's a lot of trust involved because I'm putting you and I'm putting my million dollar boat in your hands. That's, that's, that is, that requires a lot of trust. I know you could screw it up, use the wrong chemicals, cleaners, right? You know, uh, equipment. You could screw my junk up. You know, the Ising glass that I have on my boat can only have certain types of cleaners. Mm-hmm. And so I got to trust you. That's the business we're in. You might say, I'm a detailer, but you're in the trust business. This pool guy, I'm in the trust business. I happen to sell pools. You're in the trust business. You happen to do detailing, but we're in the same business. We're in the same business. As I was listening to the part about um, assignment selling, mm-hmm. so in absolutely brilliant to and i'm thinking of this both from my from where i'm selling to bring new detailers on as well as these guys going to their customers um and then thinking about how today really the the attention span has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter the most powerful social media stuff are these short videos that are under one minute right so maybe I was kind of trying to brainstorm in my own way of like utilizing short videos to have that impactful information that would help qualify your customer without having to send them, you know, the multiple pages to read. And and I'll say, if you're getting your car detailed or your boat detailed and ceramic coated, we're talking, uh, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars. When you're buying a swimming pool for fifty thousand dollars, maybe that's a bit more beefy of a thing where you would take that extra time to read 30 pages, but maybe not so much. So how with this short attention span and the what's popular in video right now, would you utilize those short video formats? So there's two different subjects we're talking about here. We're talking about shorts and we're talking about assignment selling. Now, to make it clear to everybody that's listening to this, if you read the book, what you're going to find is that what we discovered at Riverpools, if somebody read 30 pieces of our content before the initial sales appointment, they would buy 80% of the time. If they didn't hit that magical number of 30 pieces of content, the closing rates were about 25%. So it's like hockey stick-like growth of closing rates if they've consumed 30 pieces of our content. And so we saw that. I saw that. I said, holy cow. I mean, I've got to make sure to integrate content and sales process. And that's where assignment selling was born. Assignment selling is the process of being very intentional with the customer, with the prospect, so that they consume the content before the initial sales appointment. So the way that that would work, and we'll get to shorts in a minute, but the way that that would work, if I'm a detailer and I was selling to you, Dan, uh, and I was coming out to your sport fishing boat tomorrow to give you a price, um, for, you know, some type of detailing. And, you know, we're going to do this every, let's say, three months or something like that. We're going to get on the schedule. So before I do that, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you a video. Uh, I actually don't want that video to be super short, not for your assignment selling. Because what I'm trying to, I'm trying to answer questions very sp- specifically and relevant to the sales process. So to give you an example, I would say, okay, Dan, now I'm excited to come out and look at your sport fishing boat with you on Friday and give you a price. Now, before I do that, though, something that I need you to do because you're getting ready to entrust this, you know, multi-million dollar boat in the hands of a detailer. And I know you can't afford to have any issues We can't have any mistakes here. And reality is, as I'm sure you're probably aware, mistakes do happen happen in the detail industry. And so what I've got here for you is a video that I'm going to send you. And this video talks about the 10-step checklist to professionally detail a sport fishing boat. We're going to talk about how it should be done, what should be done, the, the how, what, when, where, why. We explain all those things in this video. But you need to watch it before I come out because we're going to reference some of those points on Friday. And you're going to understand the difference between those detailers that go 
the extra mile versus the ones that are doing the bare minimum of detailing. And this is going to allow us to have a much more productive conversation. So Dan, we take the time to review this video before we meet together on Friday. And you're going to say yes. That's what you're going to say because it's your million dollar boat. Now, the thing about it is if I just say to you, uh, hey, Dan, before I come out, it'd be great if you could, you know, I'm going to send you a video. It'd be great if you could give it a look. That's not smart. That's just like passively mentioning a video. What I said is, here's the assignment. Here's what it's all about and why it matters. Will you take the time to review it? Now, that's powerful. And I don't want that to be 60 seconds. I want it to be longer because I want you to have more sunk cost with me. Now, when it comes to short video, that's a different conversation. When it comes to short video, she assignment selling is really for the person that has engaged, has reached out to you and is ready to potentially spend money with you, and this takes them over the hump. Whereas short video is a great find tool, awareness tool. So if you're saying to yourself as a detailer, I want to become known in the market. I want to get my name out there, and I want to do it in a very cost-effective way. Well, one of the most cost-effective ways that you can do it in 2023 is through short video. This is why I tell you, like every single job that you do from here until the end of time, I would create a before and after journey video that shows a before and does quick cut, quick cut, quick cut. The key to a short video that makes it effective, because it's got to be 60 seconds, it's got to be vertical, right, mm -hmm. on your phone. But what makes it effective is just a few simple things. Number one you got to create a curiosity gap. A curiosity gap means that we are anticipating, how does this end? What's the payoff? I need to wait around till the end. So it's very easy when you have uh, the before-after videos because the payoff, they're already saying, is like, look what this piece of junk turned into, right? So you show some, like, something that looks awful. And that creates the curiosity along with the title, and now, once they see the end, they're like, holy cow, that was an utter transformation. So that's the curiosity gap. That's the first key to short video. The second key to short video is what we call the three-second rule. And what that means is you want to make a cut every three seconds, ideally. So that's a new scene, okay? New scene, new element, new thing. So the first cut might be, you know, where the, where the boat started. And the next cut could be you cleaning the hall next boat could could be you know you, you you're cleaning the uh cockpit and in the next boat you're detailing the engine room whatever it's cut 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 about three seconds and they could be you know different areas of the engine room that are you know three second cuts each keep doing that until the end you've got your payoff okay so that that's the second rule three second rule okay which means quick 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 and the, this allows you to essentially tell a long story in a very short period of time. The visual imaging is what's telling the different phases of the story. The third element of a short is you take things that are common to you, that you take for granted, and you show them to the rest of the world. Yeah. So to give, if, to give you an example of this, I just uh, went through um, a commercial bluefin tuna uh, season in the Outer Banks with my boat. And uh, we have a YouTube channel called Saltwater Fishing University. And so um, Shorts has been huge for us um, because it's a newer channel and it's been the quickest way for me to get on people's radar. And so I did a video on how do you get a 500 pound fish in a boat? So we call it a 500 pound tuna. And the short is me bringing it into the boat or my team bringing it into the boat. And it follows these rules. now automatically you got a curiosity gap. The curiosity gap is, oh, I want to see how they get it in. Okay, so that's your gap. And then we've got quick scene. Like, first thing is you see the tuna behind the boat in the water. Then you see us clip the mouth. And you start to see us pull it in. But then you see the winch system that we use to pull it in. And then you start to see a guy that's like jumping on the rope to get, you know, get it through the door and then you finally see it slide into the uh, into the boat and then you see us measuring it. And it's all like quick, 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 quick. So that video right there did three and a half million views on Facebook. It did almost a million on YouTube. 
you know, it got uh, about 10,000 followers on Facebook. It got uh, something like 2,500 subscribers on YouTube just from that one video. That's the power of shorts. But that's what you got to do, those three things. Okay. Now with the, um, with the, the um, assignment selling one, is that something that's better to, um, you know, I use HubSpot also, but maybe you have um, your, you know, a Vidyard in your HubSpot so you can just like use a template and send the same one to multiples? Or is that something that's better to like really make it specific to Mr. Jerry Johnson? No, this is I, for would, you. I would make one video that I use every single time for that shows the process that, that essentially makes you want to make sure they know the things they should already know when you get there. Okay. You shouldn't be spending all your time teaching them when you're getting there. Instead, once you're with them face to face, you spend your time selling. So ideally we're teaching before we're with them personally. And then we're selling once we're, with the person because the teaching's been done. There's always going to be some teaching to do when you when you meet with the prospect, but ideally there's less. Because if you spend, if the person's only got 30 minutes to meet with you and you have to spend 25 minutes showing them how everything should be done, well then, you know, you might not even get time to make a deal. So you got to leave time for the deal. You got to close the deal. And so that's why you want to do it this way. And that's the power of assignment selling. It's why you want to read the book. Now, one-to-one -one video, like tools like Vidyard, like you mentioned, are very powerful. And I would use those, especially if somebody reaches out to me, fills out a form on my site. I'd send them a quick one-to-one -one video. You know, uh, you know, hey, Mr. Jones, Marcus Sheridan here. You reached out to, to me, and I'm looking forward to talking with you about you know, detailing your yacht uh, uh, very soon. And um, I'm sure, you know, we'll be connecting here on the phone soon. So I might send that out that second. That's personalized. That's powerful. He ain't going to get that from anybody. No detailer is going to send that to him. Nobody is. So that humanizes it because the idea is before you ever shake their hand in person, they should feel like they've heard your voice, seen your face, and they know you. Those three things should always happen before you meet them and shake their hand. You've already established yourself as the authority or or the guide in that situation. That's right. By by doing so, it's and ah, I do a lot of that in my own in my own sales. Okay, so looking at um at, at writing these blog posts and um, knowing the audience um, and the coaching that I do with the guys at our network. Um, I, I'm a big stickler on running an email nurture campaign out of the backside after, you know, you've collected That's the smart. information. And I see, you know, I, the 4-1-1 email marketing style. So it, writing those nurture email campaigns and also adding video into it is awesome. And you can use the new technology of artificial intelligence like the chat GPT mm -hmm. to write those. However, you cannot do that I believe, as far as a blog post goes, or it, it'll catch on to you. Um, That's changed, or, actually. That has changed. Um, and so, so, so Google, when it comes to ChatGPT, I think quickly they realize there's no way that we're going to get around because trying to decipher what's human, what's not human, is going to almost it's going to become impossible um, to uh, to do, and it's going to be it's going to be morphed. The, what you want to do, though is if you're using ChatGPT to create content, integrate personal story and make sure you edit it so that it's first person, right? So that, you know, if, in other words, let's say that you produce an article in ChatGPT and it's, you know, um, you know five uh, stages to the perfect sport fishing uh, detail. Right, as an example, ChatGPT writes it for you. Well, first you want to look at it and say, "Do I agree with this?" Then you want to change the first paragraph every single time. First paragraph should sound something like this: "You know, here at Sheridan's Detailing, uh, one of the questions that we get from our customers is, what should we be detailing every single time?" What makes a professional job? Well, we have found that there's five fundamental stages to a professional detail job when it comes to your sport fishing boat. And in this article, we're going to explain each one of those five stages, right? So now I've 
adjusted it so that it's in my voice. It's re it's referring to my company. The person knows who wrote it. It was me. And then you just want to change anything in there to sound personalized. And if you can add a story from customers or whatever, you want to do that as well. But you can use ChatGPT and you can get SEO gains. You just want to do it right. Yeah. I love how you knew where I was going with that and got right on top of answering it. Which that's that is the biggest hurdle that these guys have is um is creating the content. So having that, there's literally no excuse for anybody anymore not to be running an email nurture campaign. And now apparently you can use it on the front end in your sales process yeah. too. So yeah. that's fantastic. Um okay. So what, what do you have another book coming in the future? Do we or what are we working on? Yeah, now? well, I actually have a book coming out uh, within the next year. Can't say the title yet, but it's going to be on transformative communication. Um, I think it's going to be a landmark book. I really do. I'm hoping that it's going to be around in a hundred years. If I can write a book that people are reading in a hundred years, man, that's going to be very powerful. So I, it's going to be an evergreen book. And if you want to become a truly transformative communicator with those in your life, personally and professionally. I think this book is, is going to be the one for you. Awesome, man. And um, as a writer, when you write these books, do you sit down at a typewriter and just sit there and tick, 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 tick type away? Or do you do you read these? And so how, how the heck, I, all you guys that write these books, like you've had a great idea and then you followed through and written a book, but what, what kind of, what's that process in a nutshell look like? I know that we're running out of time um, and I have like two more questions. for everybody. I, I am a terrible procrastinator and I usually have it all in my head. And then by the time I actually, you know, type it out on the screen, Usually books take me three weeks to write or less um, just because once I go, I just blow it out. But I, I reach a critical mass and then it's, it's like it's urgent or there's a deadline or whatever with the publisher. And then it's like, okay, I'm going to do it. But yeah, I procrastinate the heck out of it. Okay. So, it, and this is just kind of one that you, a question like, it's kind of a question that I ask a lot of people and it's really going to come down to more opinion than anything else, I think. But as you look across the span of humanity, there are some people that become successful. There are some people who just excel at whatever they're trying to do. There's other people who spin their wheels and they never really seem to be able to catch and, and get any traction in anything, including life. And I really don't think that this has anything to do with somebody's race, religion, sex, anything like that. But what is it that you think in people is that core quality that can drive somebody to become successful? And obviously you're say, a super successful yourself. Yeah. So I would just say, you know, for, for me, it has been a love of learning uh, throughout my life. I've never gotten bored with learning and I, I find it's just, it's so energizing to develop skills and uh, to, to make breakthroughs. And, you know, Jim Rohn once said, you have to learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And once you learn to develop yourself as a person, you become truly unstoppable and you'll reach the highest levels of your field. A lot of people, you know, they stop learning for the most part and stop working on themselves and, and, and developing somewhere like, you know, right around the end of high school. And what a tragedy that is, because, you know, we should just be getting started at that point. Okay. Now, when I look out at the at the sea of business books, um, as we mentioned, Jim Collins, apps, good to great, absolutely favorite, or one of my favorites, where I, it made me realize that the leadership of the company is ultimately really the head that drives everything. Um, Joey Coleman with Never Lose a Customer Again talks about what to do after you've got the, the sale closed for that first 100 days. Um, uh, building a story brand with Donald Miller. Incredible way to kind of make yourself the, the hero. And then your book, so like you're right in there with all of my, oh, and Mike Michalowicz too, who I just had on here recently. Um, when you're looking for inspiration, where what do you lean into or what's something that you kind of would look at and read yourself? Well, I mean, and I'm going to have to jump here in a second. Um, I would say that um, I'm, I'm mainly a nonfiction guy. 
I love I love nonfiction books. I love uh, good podcasts. I love listening to really um, bright minds. Um, I I have listened to Good to Great at least ten times, or listened or read, or you know, I mean, How to Win Friends and Influence People is one of the greatest. Um, I listen to Jim Rohn still to this day, uh, almost every day. I think he's the greatest like personal development mind of all time, and he's my absolute favorite. So Jim Rohn. Okay, and I promise I'm going to let you go here really, really quick. Do you utilize a business coach yourself? I, I think everybody should have some type of coach in their life. Uh, I think everybody should have at least a mentor, ideally a coach. I do utilize, I've got one, uh, two, two of my companies currently have coaches. Okay. okay. If somebody wants to uh, reach out and get your book, they can, of course, go to the bookstore and get it or buy it off of Amazon or listen to it on Audible. Um, they ask, you answer. I suggest everybody absolutely 100% do that. What other resources do you have available for guys to check out? Well, I would just say go to LinkedIn. Uh, that's a good place to find me. Um, and uh, that's that's if you if you want to learn about me, if you want my stuff, go to LinkedIn. You can always email me, Marcus at MarcusSheridan.com. Marcus, you do not really fully realize how much it meant to, for you to come on here and do a podcast with me. I'm seriously, seriously so grateful. Thank you so much for your time. You're so welcome, Dan. Thank you so much for taking a little time out of your day to hang out with us on the Owner's Pride Podcast. Questions and comments, leave them for us on the Owner's Pride Podcast Facebook page. Likes and shares shows you cares. Thank you so much, so much, so much to Marcus Sheridan for coming on the podcast. And until next time, stay glossy.